So thank you for all coming out, um, you know, um, each and every one of you. And um, I want to thank the History Department for sponsoring this. And I want to thank our chair, Jeff Wilson, Professor Wilson. And I want to put a, a, a big thank you to Professor Brendan Lindsay, who organized all the kind of nuts and bolts of the, of the whole thing, right? And so what I'd like to do is we're honored today to have our assembly member McCarty and Jack Oman from SACB here with us. And so what I want to do is I'll just, um, I'll introduce them now a little bit. When, you know, academics were very good at long-winded uh, uh, introductions, but I will not do a long-winded introduction. It'll be a short-winded okay? But uh, we're honored to have them both here, and I'll just say that uh, Kevin McCarty, after 10 years on the Sacramento uh, City Council, eight years in the legislature, He's a friend of, of education. Uh, he's on the uh, subcommittee for education finance right now, the chair. And he's been a good friend of, of public education in the state of California. He's a good friend of the CSU. And we're, we're really lucky to have a representative like, uh, like Kevin, who's a hardworking, dedicated uh, servant to the community in every, every kind of way you can imagine, right? So thank you, Kevin, for being here. Thank you so much. I guess in your district's now number six, not seven, right? Correct. Right. Okay, so they redo, we redraw it so it's six now, but according to the SAC B, if that's a, a reputable source, and the SAC B says, I never, I never, I've never seen such a, a great uh, endorsement. I know, you know Stalwart. Look at this, this is amazing. Anyway, so uh, the SAC B says that you won that district by 40 points in your last few elections. <laughs> Pretty good. Okay. So, and then we're also honored to have uh, Jack Oman. Now, now they say pictures worth a thousand words. Uh, this man can express a complicated political point um, without even using any words because he's a very talented artist. But he is not only an artist, but also he has a, a keen insight in the uh, politics, and he has to have a sense of humor as well to pull it off. And he does. And in my opinion, I think that Jack is one of the best political cartoonists in the United States today. And I'm not alone in that assessment because the Pulitzer Prize Committee thought so too. And uh, they only give those prizes to the best of the best. And so we're lucky to have uh, Jack here today. So thank you, Jack. For coming. And then uh, let's see here. So the idea would be the, for me, I'll just, bear with me, I'll do a little, maybe I promise it'll be no more than 10 minutes. And I'll do a little thing where I, as a historian in my own way, kind of frame the midterm elections with some visuals. Uh, and um, then I'll turn it over to Kevin and he can, you know, say whatever, whatever you want to say about the midterms coming up next week. And then Kevin can turn it over to Jack and then, um, Jack, you just, riff on whatever you uh, want to talk about. So the, uh, let me just continue then on to um, the little talk here. I'll just, I promise it'll be short, short and sweet. So this election, right, right this is the, um, all 50 states certified this election. This is how the Constitution, I don't really agree with Electoral College, but this is, how, this is what we got. And uh, Joe Biden won this election in 2020. And uh, all 50 states certified the vote for that election, just to be clear on that. To challenge any of the certification of the states, the House can challenge it, but you need one senator. And the reason why they, they had that rule about one senator was they wanted to cool the passions of the House with having a level-headed senator come. And if a senator agreed, to decertifying the state, that was a big deal. Well, we had 12 Republican senators falling over each other to be the, to object to it, okay. Um, and then with, with January 6th, we, what we got, and from January 6th through January was, we had uh, no concession speech from the outgoing president, that's very historically strange. No ceremonial attendance of his successor's um, inauguration, which is also, very historically strange. And not even a peaceful transfer of power, which is also um, not really historically. Um, 
you don't see that either. So a lot of historical things took place in just that, that January that we should not forget, which um, this was a sorry spectacle that led many of our allies, our closest allies abroad, to ask what has happened to America. This is a country that has lectured the world about democracy since Woodrow Wilson was president and for a hundred years and this is what our democracy looked like in uh, there's uh, Josh Hawley giving the, the fist to the crowd of insurrectionists and there he is running scampering away to safety once they they breached them the capital this is something that um, is a very bad look for American democracy and um, the next week's midterms are opportunity for people to express themselves politically at a national level the first time, for the first time since this event, these events, okay? And how one views January 6th tells you a lot about how they view the Constitution of the United States um, and the rule of law and how they view the world. Because millions of Americans right now, as I'm sure most of you know, um, do not believe that the 2020 election was fair, they believe that the, the election was rigged. Um, they see the people who attacked the Capitol as martyrs and uh, heroes. And this is something I've never seen, I never thought I would ever see as a, a Confederate flag flying in the uh, uh, Capitol. These guys are in the Senate, in the well of the Senate there. That's Nancy Pelosi's office. Um, and this was a, a really a heartbreaking kind of spectacle. So on the ballot next week are not just propositions and local measures and uh, Kevin McCarty and others, uh, but it's also respect for our governing institutions, the sanctity of our elections, the peaceful transfer of power, all on the ballot next week, right? Now this is also, see they took that from Pelosi's office there. Um, it's also, the first national election since Dobbs uh, versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization, the Supreme Court, these six members of the Supreme Court, decided to overturn and jettison 49 years of case law and precedent uh, and laying bare the fragility and tenuousness of American women's reproductive and privacy rights. Women's bodily autonomy is on the ballot. This will be the first election since that ruling last June which was pretty outrageous. There were students today uh, out protesting, which was kind of good to see, and they were protesting in favor of, of measure, uh, Proposition 1 uh, on the ballot, which will uh, codify uh, abortion rights in the state. In Pennsylvania, we have a Republican candidate, I don't have a photo of him, don't worry, I want you to mention him by name. Uh, he's running for governor, he believes the election was stolen, the 2020 election and he wants to make abortions illegal with no exceptions. They're running for the Senate in Pennsylvania, a TV doctor, he said that women's reproductive choices uh, should be made by local government officials. They should be part of the choice. In Ohio, Republican hedge fund guy who promises for, to vote for a national ban on abortion uh, is likely to win the Senate seat in Ohio. Um, if it's all de facto illegal in these 11 states, meaning that the women in those states, and uh, millions of reproductive age women are, uh, for whatever reason, that they, they are not going to be able to, to access uh, abortion rights in those states. Here is one of Jack's um, cartoons kind of illustrating that point that I just made about Dr. Oz. In Georgia, we have a Republican Senate candidate who's a former football hero who's also calling for a national abortion ban, even after two women recently came forward with proof he had pressured them to have abortions and he paid for them to have the procedure. These are the candidates we got this year, next week. Uh, there are Republican candidates who hold similar views on January 6th and women's reproductive rights, running in Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, and other states. So now, briefly, I'll just take a little trip down memory lane. And this is why American historians are pessimistic about mid the first midterm after another party takes power, especially the Democrats. So the Democrats, they, they were in power. They had set the House presidency for two years. 1994, for the first time in 40 years, they, they lost 54 seats of Newt Gingrich 
became the uh, Speaker of the House, the revolution, the Gingrich Revolution. Toxicity of our politics kind of begins uh, our modern politics. There's Gingrich. Backbencher bomb thrower who became the Speaker of the House. Um, they shut the government down to try to pressure Bill Clinton to slash Medicare. That was the first time they shut the Congress never shut the government down to get a political outcome in history. 2010, Obama was in, and the Democrats had majority for two years, Senate, uh, House, presidency, and then you get this Tea Party phenomenon um, in 2010, uh, another midterm, uh, a lot of it financed by the Koch brothers, you know, behind the scenes. Um, President Obama called it shellacking, they won 63 seats. And so, here's another Jack Oman special. So, millions of people are willing to vote in candidates, and, and when you look at 2022, so if I go back to that trip down memory lane, um, if you look at 2022, we don't know what's gonna happen. On 2018, Republicans had the House, the Senate, and the presidency, the Democrats managed to squeak out 40 seats in that first midterm. Now we're approaching the first midterm of, of uh, the party in power facing this. Okay, so um, and then I just want to say a couple things about um, we have a we have a crisis of, um, we have a crisis in values in this country. Um, this is um, this is Charleston. Uh, I mean Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Uh, 20, August 2017, the Unite the Right. Um, this stuff has been going on. Um, this was somebody, who, you know, a white supremacist attack, the counter protesters there. Um, this was an indicator of a, of a deficit in human decency. And this is recently where uh, Donald Trump Jr. thought this was very funny and posted this regarding the attack on an 82 year old man in his home. Um, from one of these MAGA people. Uh, this is, in my opinion, these are all uh, evidence of a deficiency, a deficit in human decency, which runs deeper than politics. And the fact that these young men think this is cool um, doesn't really bode well for the future, in my opinion. So what we need to do <coughs> The Republicans take the House are likely to impeach Biden, hold the debt ceiling hostage, and elevate to leadership some of the most extreme members of the caucus. They win the Senate, Mitch McConnell is gonna block, will likely block, Biden's judicial nominees and put the skids on the Democratic agenda. The day after the midterms in 2024, I mean 2022, the 2024 presidential election begins. The day after, unfortunately. We have a crisis of values in this country, this, these elections will either give oxygen and momentum to the far-right liars, rhetorical bomb throwers like Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, etc., the insurrectionists, the misogynists like Samuel Alito, and the racists, or they will slow down the momentum of these elements, send a clear nation, a message to the nation and to the world that the American people will defend the Constitution, defend the rule of law, defend women's reproductive rights, defend voting rights, civil rights, and nonviolence. We can uh, do this. We can use our vote to push against those who would delegitimize our elections and strip away our hard-earned rights. We need to get rid of this deficit in human in, uh, decency and move forward. Thank you. Here's where you are. Now let me turn it over to Kevin, and, and, and you can just uh, say what you uh, oops, say what you need to. Okay. Whatever you want. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me, Professor Joe. Um, I don't know the mic's working. Oh, I think you have to yeah, turn it on. I think the prep, I think it's Okay. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Professor uh, Palermo. I'm also an outstanding scorekeeper on the softball field. <laughs> yes, we did youth softball together. Um, you know, I love coming to Sac State. This is the heart of my district right here. 
Uh, my, this is the edge of my current district, but my new district, which I'm running for, this would be the middle. So my new district has most of the city of Sacramento and goes out to Arden, Arden Arcade, Carmichael, up to Natomas, and down south a little bit. So this pretty much is the center of my district. Um, I do focus on higher education. I chair the budget committee overseeing school funding, so this is a big deal coming to colleges. And wow, emotional day here. Our president announced that uh, after eight years, he's uh, moving on. He's been a tremendous president. I will say that Sac State is one of, is the only CSU in Northern California that's thriving. All the other CSUs of the 23 systems, kind of above Bakersfield, have massive drops in enrollment. So. This uh, Sac, Sac State campus is doing well. The president has it going on. Um, and I, I want to talk, talk, I could talk about higher ed, I'll talk about the election and politics today. But first, coming in here, I saw all these students out there studying. Not as many in here today. That's okay, we're out here studying. And um, every day I get an update on my phone as far as who's voted, because the election's next Tuesday. But every voter in California now gets a ballot mailed to them. So people are participating and sending in their ballots a bit earlier. But, um, you know, we think with all this early voting, um, a lot of people already voted, but not necessarily the case. So here in Sacramento, in my district, 15% um, of, the, of the people have voted already, of the electorate have voted already. Um, and so 85% have not voted. But, but here's the, the staggering thing that I always, we always mention young people voting and that turnout. So in, in Sacramento, California, there are um, 60,000 voters above 60, in my district, there are 60,000 voters above 65, and there are 75,000 voters between 18 and 34, so the younger voters, millennial voters. And of those, the turnout among the older population is a robust 33%. So one in three over 65 have turned in their ballot. Between 18 and 34, only 4,000 votes. So that turnout is 6%. So it just shows you that, you know, uh, no matter how hot the issues are, um, uh, abortion, youth issues, you know, we have just a continual lag in younger people uh, participating. And in my view, we see our policies like that. In, in the 80s and 90s, um, California built um, like 20 new prisons and one new university. So do you think if these numbers were the reverse, if young people were voting in that number, the old folks were, we would have those policies at the Capitol. And I, I see the equations not. So, so just, um, you know, older voters are, you know, out punching their weight. Um, I'm, not sh I'm, I'm sure the, the voter turnout here at Sac State is dramatically higher than young people 18 to 34 as a whole, but it has a major, major impact on the policies that we enact at the state Capitol. So, you know, overall about this election, you know, I'm 50 years old now. Um, every time there's been a big election in my life, people, adults and politicians say, this is the most important election in our generation, of our time. And I guess every gener election is the most important because we're alive, we're there that day. It's a true <laughs> statement. Um, we can say democracy is on the line, all these issues are on the line. That's, uh, that's certainly true. Um, but, uh, you know, I've never seen anything like this so much with the polarization in politics where you know the Speaker of the House's uh, husband was, was, was beaten up with a hammer, could have been killed, 82 year old man attacked at two in the morning with a hammer the other day. And the, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, former president's mocking it on social media, not saying hope he's okay. He's you know, saying there's some kinds of conspiracy theories and just like, you know, what is wrong with his civility in this? society. So um, that is much bigger. Um, my last thing I'm going to say before I get to your questions is California is very different in the national level. As you, as you can imagine, California is very, very blue, very Democrat state. In the legislature, we have 80 assembly members. We currently have 60 uh, Democrats, so over a two-thirds majority, um, 60 to 80, so three-quarters are Democrat. We could get up to 65 Democrats in the assembly based on elections next week. Just population, it's not because of gerrymandering or anything. We have an independent commission draw the lines. But California, the population is shifting. Um, Democrats are, are now like north of 50, 60%, a fifth, like high 50s. Um, 
Republicans are in the 20s and independents are in the 20s as well. So independents are pretty much tied with Republicans. And the re re Republican brand, just the extremism, isn't always doing well, especially on issues like democracy, choice. Um, uh, you know, those two issues are really driving independent Republicans to kind of go away. And so we're seeing that the Republican brand here in California is like more and more in the very, very rural areas where they really don't have the population. So it's very different than the national trends here in California. That being said, there are some hotly contested congressional races which would, could which could impact the balance of power. Some of those kind of in-between rural conservative areas in the Central Valley are kind of are up for grabs. So there's like three or four congressional races that it could come down to who gets to keep the, this, the House and the, and, the, and the Congress in D.C. based upon what happens here in, in California. So um, it'll be a long, a long day watching that. But the last thing here in California is we have so many people now that vote um, in, uh, by mail. Or we, we made it easier. You know, all our rules to vote are night and day towards the rest of the nation. We, we lower the barriers for uh, democracy here. We now have everybody who's pretty much a voter. If you have a driver's license, a state ID card, this is my law, you're now automatically a voter. When you're 16 years old, you go to DMV and get either an ID card or your driver's license, you're automatically pre-registered to vote. So everybody's in the queue to become a voter. So our voter um, voter registration is like, you know, almost 80, 90 uh, percent. So we, so we have a lot, of people, a lot of ways to vote. So it takes multiple days of sometimes weeks to count the ballots. So sometimes we don't know about the outcome of these elections for weeks down the road. But it is a um, really uh, interesting election across the nation. We have some hot propositions like um, Professor Palermo just outlined. And uh, you know, I love democracy. I love being able to make a difference in public policy. But I also love watching the, the campaigns and so forth. So uh, look, thanks for the invitation to be here today and look forward to your Q&A. I wish I could give you a chirpy assessment of what I think is going to happen. And I'll give you a little preface to this. Um, I know it's rather difficult to believe, but I actually voted for quite a number of Republicans for the U.S. Senate in the 1980s um, in Oregon. And we had uh, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, who was Senator Packwood, who was a pro-choice Republican. Um, and Senator Hatfield, who was chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, um, who was not pro-choice, but was actually quite moderate in his moment. And so it wasn't like a big swing for Democrats to vote for Hatfield and Packwood. Um, and now, you know, it used to be a somewhat ecumenical political environment where you would have people who were reasonable people who believed in the Constitution of the United States, and now you have people who are literally insurrectionists running for governorships of major states and for U.S. Senate seats. I, I can't tell you how troubling this is. You know all, uh, how bad it is. And I, I'm truly despairing right now. And I hate to be that way because, you know, I'm a chirpy Minnesotan too, and I like to be optimistic about things. And so, I have to say that I do think this is going to sort out, probably in the way that Northern Ireland's sorted out. Um, it's going to be ugly. And um, some, a commentator said, yesterday I was watching, who said we were already in a cold civil war, and I think that's true, um, but I don't think we've begun to see some of the violence that could happen. Now, you're 50, and how old are you? You're under 60. Oh, you're my age, okay. So we can both remember when Kennedy was killed, President Kennedy was killed, and when Bob Kennedy was killed, and when Martin Luther King was killed. And I actually went to Robert Kennedy's burial at Arlington just to give you some historical perspective as a seven-year-old. And if there were, we've gone through terrible periods in American history, starting with the Civil War, uh, you know, the, there were tremendous amounts of violence during the Civil Rights era, um, and so on. 
this is not really probably comparable to the U.S. Civil War in some ways, um, because it's not, as somebody noted, this is not going to be state versus state militias fighting each other. Every state has lots and lots of people on both sides who could potentially clash violently. And I think about January 6th as a missed opportunity um, because for some reason there were moments of lucidity on the Republican side where um, leader McCarthy and leader McConnell had expressed normal views of what this sort of thing was. And so we have McCarthy turning on a dime uh, in days, and McConnell has been, you know, silentish. And his own wife was in the Trump cabinet, and she quit because of this. And so when you have McCarthy, you know, I, I think zero about Kevin McCarthy um, in terms of his skill set. Um, but McConnell's a smart guy, and I cannot understand why they think that Herschel Walker would be a United States Senator who would be effective. I cannot understand why they think Mehmet Oz would be an effective United States Senator. I cannot understand why they think that, you know, J.D. Vance is, an, is not an idiot, but like, how did we get to J.D. Vance saying in 2016 that Trump was, I think he said, Hitlerian almost, right? I mean, it's like danger to the democracy, and here he is being humiliated by Trump on stage. Humiliated. Ted Cruz, Trump attacked his wife personally in public. Cruz showed one moment of courage on the stage at the Republican convention, and I watched that and I thought, okay, you can do that. I get it. But Lindsey Graham, humiliated by Trump. I mean, there's just a litany of these people who were saying in 2016 in the early primary states, and then all of a sudden they lost their nerve, and now they're their golf partners. This is not a tenable model for this country. Any more than it's a tenable model to have a football game where you're arguing about the rules. It's like, well, you get across that line, that's a touchdown. Oh, well, I don't, that's not a line. I mean, that's where we are, where you're, you, you have people in this country who think that QAnon is a thing. Like, I cannot believe that we're discussing this. This is like discussing a comic book. It, it, it's completely insane. You have members of Congress on the floor, you know, publicly espousing this crazy stuff. And... I don't know how we get out of this. I mean, I think to, I think the election is going to be, and I don't say this in like a Democrat Republican way, although they forced me to do it. Um, I, I worked in politics. I mean, I, you and I talked about this. I worked in politics in Minnesota in 1976 and 1978. I went door to door for uh, DFL uh, political candidates. Uh, that was Democratic Farmer Labor Party, and they, that's what they call the Democratic Party of Minnesota. And, um, you know, Hubert Humphrey was our U.S. Senator. He was our junior senator. And Fritz Mondale was our senior senator. So it was, we had effective political representation. And you go door to door, and I wasn't hearing stuff like this, even from Republicans in 1976. Like, we thought Reagan was crazy, right? And now, doesn't that look like the golden age of American politics? No, seriously. I mean, you're, you're old enough to remember. Where, you know, oh my God, Reagan was elected, the world's gonna end. And now you look at it like, wow, he's Dwight Eisenhower compared to this guy. Uh, and the, the, the vicious attacks, the personal attacks, and I say this as a political cartoonist, okay? I, I don't really do vicious, I do ironic, I do wry, I do satirical, you know? This is a level of garbage that, like, is a completely incomprehensible to me. Uh, for example, QAnon, and then I'll be quiet, um, one of my best friends in political cartooning is a, a guy named Matt Worker from Politico, who some of you may have seen. 
His son worked in the pizza parlor where the Pizzagate incident happened, where they just, and the, you know, they said, oh, they're running a pedophile ring in the back of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C.? Well, a guy went in there with an AR-15, and thank God he didn't get any shots off because his son probably would have been killed. So, you know, and uh, this guy and I grew up in the pre-internet era, um, where these people were nailing up their posters on telephone poles. And they were Xerox, and they, you know, and now it's like you can cre create Hitler Facebook groups, probably, right? Or Twitter. And so now these people have the ability to instantly communicate, which is in some ways great, and in some ways, look at Elon Musk. He's a mentally ill genius. We have met Donald Trump is clearly mentally ill. How did this happen? You got me, but I'm very concerned. So. <laughs> now that you've called everybody out, any questions? Well, you know, know, come on, let's keep it real, yo. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's. Yeah, no, it's true. Yes, sir. This one might be, let's see. It should, it should be first. You hold it, I guess? That's what they told me. Uh, anyway, so, some of them are a I'm a constituent of yours, but my question is about uh, not really the midterms. Uh, you may be aware of this uh, Supreme Court case from North Carolina about the independent uh, state legislature theory. Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's generally the idea that the Supreme Court could nullify or allow state legislatures to override federal law, federal election law, and basically choose electoral victories. I don't know if you're following me, but I was just wondering if the California state legislature had thought about what might happen if that is supported and states like Florida or Arizona throw federal elections to certain presidential candidates against the wishes of their of the voters. And because we, as you said, we kind of sit in our own little area here in California and we're quote unquote safe. Well are we safe? <laughs> and second of all, have there been any discussions about if that were to happen, what either the governor or the state legislator would do in that case, speaking of civil wars and all that, not claiming to Yeah, we've heard a mean, lot about that in other yeah. states. Coming up with ideas, the scarier thing is there's, I think, 12 or so individuals running for secretary of state, and they're just flat out deniers of the election results, saying that there was conspiracy theories, there was big lies, there was, you know, all these ballots that were dumped. Um, you know, like some of the states I saw the other day in Arizona, there were like eight people that were arrested for voter fraud. Eight. And some of them were actually Republicans who like, you know, did things inappropriately. So there are some of these states that are trying to have a, 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 guy, a guy or gal in charge of elections who could muck with that. Some states are trying to see if the legislature can elect their own alternatives for electors to deny the results of that state. Um, those are all hypotheticals, it hasn't happened yet. I hope it doesn't happen. Um, and then I think there would be some right away serious um, challenges in the court system. And I don't even think that even Trump's Supreme Court, I like to think that they would think that's a bridge too far. You know, I think that they're fine, you know, getting rid of other issues. But this one I think is the fundamentals of democracy in our nation. So I think that would lead to, that would, lead to a type of civil war type thing. I don't think they want that on their, in their hands. What we would do in California, I don't know. It's, it's a, first of all, I don't think that we would have an, a need to overturn the will of the voters anyway in California because they would, I don't see them being on that kind of side of that equation. Um, I wouldn't want to do what they're doing just because they're doing it because, you know, the wrong doesn't make a wrong right over here. Um, but uh, it is something that I've been watching, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for coming to the university, by the way. Um, I wanted to ask, so I'm 
40 years old, so I'm in that bracket that you're talking about if only 6% uh, of them are voting or, or submitted their, uh, left, uh, their ballots already. Um, I get that the propositions, I feel like, make a difference, or my vote feels important for these propositions. But my vote, I don't feel my vote makes a difference when it comes to governors, Congress people, the Senate, uh, assembly members within California, because like you mentioned, you're heavily blue. So with my peers and everything we discussed this, it doesn't feel like our vote makes a difference when it comes to that. And whoever gets voted in, it doesn't feel like there's a change in my everyday life, let's say. Like it's still incredibly expensive to exist here in California and to survive in California. So I was just curious what either of you have to say to um, younger voters within this 18 and 34 bracket of that their vote matters when it comes to these things. Yeah. Well, as someone who lost an election by 202 votes, every vote does matter. That's, you know, 101 people changing their vote the other direction. So, like, there are um, elections here that have those small, small margins. Um, you know, there are countless examples of, of just razor thin elections. Um, but I, I'd say two things that, that one, um, your vote cumulatively matters on these state policy issues. Not you per se, but a bunch of yous. All of you came out and voted for a proposition on uh, rent control, for example, or on environmental issues, or on college affordability. Like, I'm, so I'm thinking about putting a measure on the ballot in a couple years, which would fund, um, in California, more financial aid to make college debt-free. Not free college, like AOC and those, I'm not I'm really adverse to that, but I don't think we really can't afford it, but debt-free so people can graduate without debt thresholds. Um, and that's like $2 billion. And so, you know, if, if we had all young people in this cohort participating in something like that, I think it would make a difference. Um, uh, I, I, just, I just think that, you know, I've heard this over and over for years, and sometimes young voters get excited about, you know, legalizing marijuana or increasing the minimum wage. I'm surely a lot of uh, voters, uh, women, and also you know males too, are interested in the in the reproductive prop one. So there are things hot that issues that bring people. So all politics are local, but it's the, total, the totality of the ballot as a whole. And on city council races, there's there's a city council race here in the heart center of the city, and there's very extremes on their views. They're both Democrats, it makes you in the same party, but one has a different view of you know homelessness and important housing versus the other. And so there are really these, these micro um, elections too that impact people's lives. I'm sure you're a very nice person. And that was to be insulting. But I'm old enough to be your father, possibly grandfather, so let me just lay it out for you in an Uncle Jack sort of way. You don't need elections to be exciting. The smallest race, the Rockland City Council race, you get a say in it. You get a say in whether this guy goes to the assembly or not. You get a say in whether Gavin Newsom gets to continue. You get a say in whether Alex Padilla gets to continue. You get a say in who the President of the United States is. Demographics are different in different states and different regions of different states. And so to say, oh, Obama's not on the ballot, for example, I'm not excited by this. So I am not going to vote in a congressional campaign where like actually the real action is. I mean, you have to think about this granular, on a granular level. The President of the United States has the power to launch nuclear weapons. It's important. United States Senate has uh, it, the Congress, the House of Representatives has the power to declare war. The United States Senate has the power to, you know, confirm Supreme Court justices, and the list goes on and on and on. And I'm constantly amazed by people saying, "I'm not excited by this." It, it's not exciting. It's 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 important. There's so many countries in this in the world where they don't have a functional voting system, as we understand it. And I would, look, I would point you to Brazil. Did you see what happened in Brazil? Where the, this guy who won was in jail for three years, and now he is the new president of Brazil. 
That's an important vote. What if Joe Biden hadn't been elected? And again, I would love to have, you know, some sort of pleasant six-party system where, you know, the exact guy lines up, you know, with my, or woman, it lines up with my precise political philosophy. We do have these people on the ballot, but like, I'm not, I think your most significant opponent in the last cycle prior to this one was a libertarian, if I'm not mistaken, was he not? We'll see. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I do remember. I mean, he was, you know, he was a perfectly fine fellow who, you know, had no business running for public office. And so what happens is when people like you, I hope you voted. Oh, absolutely. Okay, yes. but when, when people, you know, I have children your age, okay? I have a 34-year-old and a 31-year-old and, and a 28-year-old. And I hear this stuff all the time. You know, oh, Dad, how can you vote for Biden? He's so out of it, he's so conservative, he's so old. And I said to my daughter, who is a Warren person, Joe Biden was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's been in the United States Senate for 36 years. He was eight years vice president, the first black president of the United States. Joe Biden, arguably, is the person who got gay marriage across the gold line. And Joe Biden served with Hubert Humphreys for six years, my boyhood senator. How am I going to walk away from Joe Biden, right? Now, wow, I wish Jack Kennedy were running again. Wow, I wish Bobby Kennedy were running again. Those are exciting political figures. Joe Biden is not an exciting political figure. He is an Eisenhower type. But I feel a lot better about living in this country because a sane, decent, linear-thinking guy who worked within the Senate, who worked with Republicans, who was, you know, Probably the most, one of the most liberal guys in the Senate when he first came in at age 29, um, when he was elected. And so, you know, uh, I actually have to say I call myself an Eisenhower Democrat. You know, is it exciting? Not really. But I like boring. I like kind of, you know, a stable environment. And we're moving towards, I, I think, there are a lot of Republicans who absolutely do not agree with Donald Trump and vote for him anyway because they're going to get a marginal tax rate reduction of 2% or something like that. Well, let's look at your U.S. economy and how you're going to vote on it when, you know, they're burning down the cities and people are getting shot in random ways all over the you know, country. How's that economy look like? What does that look like to you? So I would say to you, that was my long Uncle Jack answer of saying every vote in every election, Water, district, sewer board, dog catcher, I don't care what it is. They all matter. Oh, I only had a blue suit and a red tie on. <laughs> and I'm not cutting my hair. Um, go ahead. There's, there's someone behind you, too, Mona. But you could, go ahead if you want. Or, you want to go? Go ahead. Okay. And then, no, go ahead. Um, I wanted to know how you guys feel whether California is moving in a more progressive direction or if we're regressing due to the, you know, the cost of living in California and so many people moving out of state into more affordable places, possibly affordable, like Texas. And, and a, a bit of context, and I'm sure Assemblymember McCarthy is sick of hearing about this. I work with um, Senator Richard Pan and Crystal Strait. I worked on um, drafting SB 866, which was to allow 15-year-olds in California to get the COVID vaccine uh, without parental consent. And that bill was shelved due to the amount of hesitation from our old Democrats with a supermajority in the assembly, uh, hesitating to vote uh, because, you know, there were certain anti-vax sentiments. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second thing first. I'm a progressive um, Democrat, you know, one of the, I'm in the progressive caucus, super liberal. And I don't know if that vaccination issue on um, 15-year-olds was progressive or not. I, I had doubts about it. I'm a progressive. I have 14-year-olds. Um, you know, decision-making is on something that important. I'm not sure, um, you know, is, is something that 13-year-olds probably, I, I, didn't, don't, so I didn't support 13. I went to 15, that's probably a little more comfortable. But even, you know, rational, progressive Democrats had doubts about it. I don't think it was a, an issue about that. Um, I just think too, 
that with so many the medical community showing that the um, vaccination rates in high school in that age bracket and just the risk and reward scenario. It, it, and, it, and lastly, I didn't see a clamoring. I didn't see, maybe you saw a few, but I didn't have a lot of 15 high school students who came out and says, I would like to get a vaccine, my parents won't let me. There wasn't a lot of examples. And usually when you do a massive bill like that, a big lift, there has to be like a big reason behind that. So that's why that, I think that paused. There wasn't the, the number of votes to do that. Um, but is California becoming more or less progressive? I would, if you ask most people across the nation, they think you're becoming more progressive on our, on, our, on our social issues. I do think that people that are um, remaining here in California is really interesting. It's very wealthy. It's super, super lower income. And we're finding a lot of people in the middle class can vote with their feet. If you're super poor, you're kind of stuck. You're place bound because of the economy and family and so forth. But people who are in the middle, we've seen people who are, who are leaving to go to other states. Overall, California's population is not taking a massive dip. You know, we grew by a little bit as opposed to this in the last few years. Do you know what the number, the number, the actual net loss is? Minimal. It's minimal. Minimal. 38,000. Minimal, yeah. It's nothing. It's like there's 40 million people here. And the flip side is you, you and It's all Canada. You, We're the size of Canada. And you, you and everybody say, um, housing is crazy expensive, which it is for young people. I, I feel from the generation graduating from college today, trying to get a job and so forth. Think if we didn't have this. Think if we had this growth in California, like Texas and Florida had. Think how much how fewer housing there would be for people here in the first place. We're facing here in Cal Sacramento, especially um, with the wealth that people from the Bay Area now can work from home. This remote stuff. They're taking up a lot of the housing stock and really having a trickle down impact on young people and college students. And so, you know, overall, California is very, very uh, blue. It's gotten bluer in the last decade or so, whether it's, you know, the progressive, super, super progressive, you know, free college, and, you know, health care for all, um, you know, defund the police types the rhetoric for that. I don't think we're that liberal as the Fox Media says we are, but we are a very, very progressive blue state. Um, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add on because that's what I was referring to and I found that interesting that um, you say that 15 year olds aren't exactly mature enough. And you know, I don't want this to be a full blown argument, but what I meant by California being less progressive is being swayed by even the slightest of, um, you know, anti-left, possibly right rhetoric that kind of uh, finds its way inside the heads of certain individuals. As for example... No, I, I, I want to just, Crystal, go to cut you off at this. I'm not saying that you're not. I'm saying that us lawmakers, we're not persuaded because of the right. We're persuaded because we literally have 15-year-olds. I have two 14-year-olds that a bunch of my lawmakers literally live in this world, that we have kids, and we're like, hmm, looking at our kids and our generation. It's not at all because of the rights, because of our own feelings. And I think that, you know, I don't want to push back on you, but that minimizes that we have a job to do. And I, I'm going to get reelected, as we said earlier, whether this vote or not. This is not any impact on my reelectability. I won, like I said, my 40 points. But I would again my 40 points. I'm going to do what I think is right. And that's why I got elected to make the right call. And so I just think that enough, enough of the lawmakers did not think that this was the right call. In, in the totality of everything that's happening with the pandemic. So I don't want to, I just want to make sure we're clear on, on the, what the, the feelings from, you know, the hesitant uh, Democrats. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I, was, I just wanted to say because um, the reason I say that is the Journal of American Medical Association did say 15 year olds are completely scientifically mature enough to make their own health decisions and to ignore that scientific fact and go on your you know, personal biases is what I meant, but yeah, I understand. Okay, so Mona, you want to? Um, yeah, I have a question that's primarily for Jack Oman. I really picked up on the comment you made um, almost offhandedly talking about your own political cartooning, that you don't do vicious, right? That you do irony, you do satire, but you don't do vicious. And my question to you is, and this is maybe to provide Maybe a little vicious. <laughs> <laughs> but to number two is, 
you know, we've seen a lot of um, images today on the screen of violence and by both violent language and tweets and actual violence. And you know, we live in this world, right? We've all heard a lot of viciousness and violence that primarily comes from one side in this country right now. And so I guess my question is, as an artist and um, also as a member of the political civil community, you know, how do we counter that level of viciousness and violence that um, very quickly leaps from the level of rhetoric to attacking 82-year-old men? Well, I, I think that's a PhD dissertation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's, a, it's a good question because, you know, this country has a long history of political violence. I mean, we started from a revolution. Um, we have a long history of, uh, you know, goofy behavior that we've managed to overcome because mostly sensible people served in public office. I mean, the notion that a Margaret, Marjorie Taylor Greene or a Lauren Boebert or you know, any one of dozens of other members of Congress would be listened to it is, is astonishing to me. I mean, it's like a person babbling out in the park. You know, They need treatment. They don't need to be in Congress. Um, are you asking me how you lower the temperature? How, how do you respond when you, I mean, you have a choice of what language and imagery you use, right, and, and encapsulating this world. Does tit for tat not work, or? Well, I mean, if, if the Democrats are fighting by the Marquis of Queensbury rules and the Republicans are shooting at you with an AR-15 in terms of the level of rhetoric, you tell me. I mean, and I don't say that in a flip way. I say that as somebody who's in some ways rather culturally conservative. I mean, my wife was a former Salvation Army captain, for example, you know. I grew up and owned guns, with guns. I'm not against gun ownership. Uh, I am against AR-15 ownership. The guy who invented the AR-15 was against, you know, that was a military weapon. But like, so, you know, not everybody is just the one thing, okay? And so, you know, when I sit down, I, I don't just randomly say things about Republicans because it's fun to say things about Republicans. I'm reacting to a specific public policy point or statement. It's just, it's every day there's something off the wall. I mean, I actually pity you. You know what I mean? Because you're like, and I, listen, I worked in politics, it's very difficult. I worked for a congressional candidate in 1978, which was the Jarvis year, in Minnesota. And I, you know, you would hear things. I mean, I would drive this guy around, and he's now in his 70s, but um, he served three terms, four terms in Congress in Minnesota in the 80s. And, uh, of course, he lost the year I worked for him. But, you know, they're, they're, the information, I'll tell you the biggest problem is the information culture has gotten atomized. So when I was growing up and Palermo was growing up, not so much this guy, but he got up, good evening, this is Walter Cronkite with the CBS Evening News, and it was Fentley Brinkley, and it was Peter Jennings, and you know, you had the New York Times, and, you, and two or three local daily newspapers, not just one. Um, you know, we had two daily newspapers here, a conservative paper and a historically New Deal liberal paper. And so one of those went away. And so now in my business, Gannett, which is, I think, the largest media company in the United States in terms of newspapers, they just announced a couple weeks ago that they were no longer publishing any opinion. They're not having editorial pages. That's 236 newspapers in the United States that are not going to have editorial pages. Well, I, I, Gannett was a client of mine. Well, that was a third of my income right out the window. Um, and I don't say that in, I just say that in a despairing way. That, that, that there are so many elements that have contributed to this problem that, I, I, again, I could write a book about it. And we don't have time, and it's 110. But, and, and you see it, you know, I'm sure when you go door to door, do you still go door to door? Yeah. Yeah. You look at me, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely.
So uh, my wife is running for the school board over here. And when I'm out in East Sacramento and I'm knocking on doors for her, probably once every time out there for several hours, I get a question from a voter, it's always pretty much a Republican voter, and they say, you know, something that I, I never thought they'd say at a school board election. They say, well, where, what is she doing in Sac City on CRT? What? Critical race theory. And I said, well, number one, Sac City doesn't, there is no critical race theory in California. Its, it's curriculum is authored by the state, not by um, the um, local school board. They adopt curriculum. And thirdly, I, my kids are in middle school right now. I see their curriculum. They, there's no critical race theory. They talk about slavery and the Holocaust and, and, and um, you know, uh, stuff like that, just like they did when I was in middle school. And they're like, oh, okay, good. Most of these voters, they're like, they're relieved. They're not like angry. They're just taught stuff on the other side because the other side, they're acting. They're lying, trying to, to go after this small, rabid piece of their electorate because they're the loudest. The Republican Party, they're not all those Trump or the loudest ones are the MAGA folks. And most people in Republicans don't believe this stuff. I've literally sat in a meeting with Kevin McCarthy in the last year with a delegation of California Democrats, and afterwards, we kind of know each other, McCarthy and I, because our names are similar. Like, we always get confused. So, like, I have his cell phone number in DC, like a year Good, ago. Good, I want to call him. Yeah. And we're like, hey, we're here. He's like, come on by. And my Democratic cell members are like, what, McCarthy? I'm like, yeah, he invites to go to his office. So, like, went in there, started shooting the shit with him about California, and he was a moderate, you know. Republican. It was like the half another effort and half build up in Oregon. He won an award for being, um, you know, somebody who went out on a limb and, and did, you know, worked across the you know, the party lines. But th they have to put on this act. And luckily, in the legislature, we don't see that as much. Every once in a while, like Kevin Connie's give a big speech on the floor, but he's oh, there's he's, a leader he, for the twenty first century. He's just a talking yeah. point. Most Republicans. They realize we have to get stuff done. Send my warm regards, incidentally. <laughs> um, but uh, it's really sad in my part because if you ask them who won the election, they'll tell you. They know that Trump didn't win, but they know if they say that Trump um, lost, there's a chance that they could be primaried in their election and lose. Or killed. Or killed. Yeah, and then you, I saw the other day on 60 Minutes this election official in Arizona. He was the Secretary of State. And he, uh, a big supporter of Trump, but he ran for president. He believes in low, you know, smaller government, lower taxes, free market, you know, stuff that the Trump platform was pushing. He probably was disgusted by the personal antics even in 2016, but he has a picture of him campaigning with Trump. He got elected Secretary of State in Arizona, and he, um, he oversaw last year's, or 20, 2020 elections, and he's the famous call that Rudy Giuliani says, hey, I have examples of massive voter fraud in Arizona. And the guy says, yeah, come on, show it to me. And so they showed up in the big meeting in Arizona two weeks later, and, and he says, okay, where, where are the examples? And Giuliani looked at the lawyers, his partner, and says, where are they? And the woman says, they're in the hotel. And so the guy's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll wait. So they, and what, there's no magic thing. And so he realized, he's like, no, I'm, I'm a Republican. I support Trump's economic policies, but he lost this election. So I'm gonna go out and tell the truth. And then he did that, and like he was threatened at his house by people with guns. And this is a guy that's a big Republican. I think he, that was the speaker. That's right, the yeah. speaker. And he, finally, was the secretary. he finally lost. I think they both were on this thing. And he finally lost, yeah. and um, he, um, he said the other day, like, it's a relief. And I, I feel for these Republicans, because they don't, they don't believe this stuff, they're acting. And that's the sad part, is they're willing to throw away all of their values in this craven quest for power. And that's why it's really sad for me to see someone like Kevin McCarthy, because I know he doesn't believe this nonsense. But he's willing to eat all that BS in his quest to get the number one spot and make power in our country. Well, the phrase, what profit is a man, you know, comes immediately to mind because, okay, Kevin McCarthy gets to be speaker, 
of, of what? You know, it's like a Seinfeld episode, you know. A king of nothing, Jerry, because that's what's going to happen when this guy becomes speaker. I wish you were Kevin Kiley sitting next to me, because I know you're a good guy, but I would love to have a long public conversation with Kevin Kiley about just what the hell he's thinking. He he's, doesn't believe he's, he's acting. Of course he doesn't he's believe it. I mean, of course that he doesn't believe it. That's the thing. He, he, you know, he went to Harvard and Yale. This is a very intelligent guy. And guys like that are willing to go up and say this stuff, and it, it could destroy the country as we understand it. And I don't understand that. I mean, I, I really don't. And I want to, but, um, you know, we, it, it's like a, we have a public elected officials, of which this guy is an, an effective advocate and public official, and people in journalism, they've got an obligation, we've got an obligation to tell you the truth. If I'm telling you those chairs are brown, they're brown. If I'm telling you he's wearing a blue blazer, it's a blue blazer. I'm not saying we don't accidentally misinterpret things from time to time, or there isn't you know, stuff around the edges that we get wrong. We do. Um, but like, I don't see Kevin McCarthy putting out corrections or apologizing. I mean, that, that, that you would have somebody like, you know, who's telling a Hitlerian big lie. Where is this country? And yeah, he gets called on it, but you know, they're leading in the polls right now. I just saw the last CNN, it was 51-47. You know, maybe they hold the Senate, maybe they don't. Um, but, and you know, I wish they could be funnier. I'd love to go give a funny speech. Um, but it, it, it's, it's incredibly disturbing. <coughs> well, I'll add my two cents, I'll just say, uh, Thanks. I would, I'd say that like what's really significant, like as an American historian, institutionalist, and stuff, is that they have the Supreme Court. This court is just getting started, and um, the court can rule like they did with abortions. So we'll leave it to the states. Well, that means that um, like a state like Missouri or Wisconsin, I mean, there are millions of women who are really held hostage by the um, gerrymandered legislatures down there. Like they, they vote, they, they, they vote for uh, you know, pro-choice people, whatever, doesn't matter because the legislatures are so gerrymandered in states. And then see the Supreme Court, when they brought the court case, say hey, these gerrymanders are unconstitutional, which they clearly are. The Supreme Court, oh no, well, it's up to the state. Well, so, the problem, the way I see it, where it's heading, that's even weaker than, I think, you know, I, I don't, but they're aiming to partition the country, I think, but the, the blue states, red state dichotomy is false, because there's, it's purple everywhere. There, there are millions and millions of Democrats in those states, right? And, but they, they <coughs> like to make it look like, okay, so Missouri, you take a state like Missouri, or what they want to turn Wisconsin into, or North Carolina, or the, they, they want to gerrymander the legislature <clears throat> to the point where it doesn't matter uh, how the people in that state vote, that it's just going to be a... a so it's, it's not a red state, it's a gerrymandered hostage state, really, for a lot the, of the, the people. De the that's Democrats kind of, would not lose the House if the, if the districts were drawn. Right, that's, that's the other thing. You see, that's the federal... The Supreme Court, if it were a real Supreme Court, they would have stepped in and said, no, you can't gerrymander this stuff like that. Because it destroys the institutional integrity of the House of Representatives, which they've done to a large degree with the, the radical gerrymandering, right? And so there should, there's only like 30 seats in play. There should be 100 seats in play, at least, right? And that was normal. Like we were talking about politics back in the day, it was normal for it to you know, go 100 seats this way, 100 seats that way. And now it's like, oh, well, it all comes down to these 30 seats is because of the, the gerrymandering. Now, I think, they, I think the billionaire class has decided that they can control the country, the United States is too big to control uh, as a whole. So they're going to try to partition it into this red state, blue state thing. And the Supreme Court says, okay, well, we'll leave abortion in the states. And they go, okay, well, we'll leave gerrymandering in the states. And they, they say, uh, we'll leave Medicaid expansion to the states. Pretty soon they're going to rule, oh, we'll leave Social Security to the states. Or we'll leave Medicare to the states. 
And if they just keep ruling that way, there will be a, the country will be partitioned. And then that's one point. The other thing they do intellectually is they do the, uh, what's called an inverted narrative, uh, um, preemptive narrative inversion. They invert the narrative. So when you hear the Republicans say, my opponent's a pedophile, my opponent is a, you know, a, a murdering communist or whatever, um, they're getting out in front of the, of the, they're inverting the, remember, you know, a lot of times it sounds like they're projecting. So my opponent will do anything to win. Well, Trump does and, that. Yeah, yeah, and they're inverting the narrative, and that's like a, Ru you know, Russia, Russian propaganda. To, you know, you can't. That's a hard one. That's a real hard one to deal with. I mean, they're going to invert the narrative like that. Yeah, go ahead. So on that related to that topic of gerrymandering, um, you know, one of the things that uh, sort of creates and reinforces that is a winner-take-all voting, uh, which sort of helps reinforce this uh, two-party system. And related to the other question before, you know, where people, like here in California, we don't feel like our vote really matters because there's such a majority, but then the minority feels like they are disenfranchised, you know, in the concept of lost votes, right? Again, because of winner take all. Um, you're obviously in a very interesting point of our history where, you know, the fundamentals of democracy are, are being questioned. Um, why isn't it more, uh, why aren't we looking at alternative systems like ranked choice voting, which can help maybe not completely alleviate all these things, but but are a an incremental path to uh, you know empowering more people? Yeah, I think that Kevin probably had some. Yeah, can you just say one quick yeah. look at Alaska? Yeah. You're going to have a Democrat, and that, she's going to get elected again, the Democrat, because of ranked choice. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's ranked choice because ranked choice still is winner take all. It just has the third place person having a little bit of say who is the winner that takes all. I think you're talking about some more like in Israel or you know in England where they have proportional representation based upon the parties and so forth. Yeah, um, we don't necessarily have that. It's it's, it's in our you know constitution you know at, at the federal system, which kind of is our de facto what we do here in the states. Um, would you I, like to come out against the Electoral College with me? <laughs> I would be fine with that. Um, but like those billionaires realize that they don't care about Trump. This, they, they just think that's the path to be able to, to keep their power and you know interest of extreme wealth and their perspective on top. And so um, they will never ever change that. And you know I think it's bizarre that we have you know some states. Who has the population of essentially, you know, the Sacramento region right here? It's <laughs> like what? You have a suit U.S. senator. You have two there, like in Wyoming. Like, right. you know, there's two senators, and Liz Cheney is the Congress member for the entire state. Yeah. Like, people just realize that because of the election this past year, they're focusing on that state. But here in California, we have 55 members of Congress. Um, you know, I think we ought to continue to tinker with democracy. It's not a perfect system here. I think it's you know one of the best, if not the best, in the world we have here. We have these craziness for elections, but by and large, we're not you know a banana republic where people who lose elections get to like overthrow and kill people and take back power. Um, our test of democracy has largely succeeded. There are serious fault lines now. I'm more optimistic than hopefully Jack is. Good. But because you know, I, I need you to Yeah, I think, you know, our, 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 like my sailors, we've never been so divided in our country. We had a civil war. We were killing each other. And, and hopefully we're not going to see that level of violence. But I am, I am confident that our experiment in democracy for the last 200 years, 300 years here in this country will continue to thrive. Okay, so on that note, maybe that's a good idea.